Hi, so I'm going to talk a little bit about concepts here, actually, and some of the guiding principles, if you like. And to do that, I'm going to do some things that seem a little silly at first, a little fatuous. But bear with it, because it'll make sense at the end of the day. Anyhow, let's have, having given you that warning, I'm now going to do that stuff. But like I say, I'm being deliberately silly. Okay, so let's have a look at this thing. This thing is clearly a light switch. Watch what happens when I do that with it. Isn't that awesome? It turns the lights off and on. Now, the thing that I wonder is, how do the lights know? When I press that switch, how do the lights know to go off? What is it that tells them to go off? And of course, that's a stupid question, because nothing tells them to go off. It's built so that it will operate that way. But I have a choice when I look at this. I have a choice to either say that I break the wire and the lights will turn off all part of the system that the lights and switch is. Or I have another choice to be able to say that the lights sense that the switch has been turned off. Now it makes no sense to say such a thing when we're talking about a single light switch. But actually, that is exactly what we're doing when we're thinking about computing. In the last video, where we're talking about the early days of uh, voltage regulation, we looked at this as an electromechanical voltage regulator. And when we applied a voltage to the coil, we changed the field strength that was being generated, and that moved that switch, turning it off. Now, in a, a way, this is a sensor. It senses the change in voltage and turns off the switch. But of course that's only one way of looking at it. Actually it is intrinsic to the property of what we've built. We put more voltage in there, that magnetic field is going to get stronger and it is going to turn that off because it just must do. There is no sensing going on here in the same way that there is no sensing when I turn off the light. But actually, there is also sensing going on here because that field strength changes dependent on the voltage. So this is a bit of a crossover point. It's easy to see when we put a light switch off and on that no sensing is involved. It gets a little bit more complicated that no sensing is involved, but sensing is involved when you get to a device like this, where it's kind of a bit of a crossover, really, but it's still essentially the same thing. And actually, we are just making a choice about how we see it. We can see it as sensing, or we can see it as intrinsic. Either way, it's good. It's a way of talking about it. Now, when we're looking at individual things, like a light switch or a single mechanical relay, it's easy to see what I'm talking about, because you can see them, because they're big enough to see. But when I have a million little switches and each one smaller than a pinhead and it's encased in a black box, you can't see it. And when we talk about it as sensing something, it becomes mysterious. And that's where the problem arises. Because these things operate not because they're magical, but because they're built to operate that way. This thing both does and doesn't sense the current because it's, sorry, the voltage, because it's built to operate that way. It's the same thing in a computer. A computer is nothing more than a million or a billion switches in the position of off and on. Depending on their position, they'll do something. That something is intrinsic to the property of the way the switches are switched. That's all there is. Now, it's often viewed that the um, first computer was, in fact, something called the Jacquard Loom. Now, a loom works because you raise some strings up and down. And you have all these strings running in one direction, and they're different colours. And you have another string that you weave in and out in that direction. Depending on where those strings in that direction are lifted, the colours will change. If I lift, if I have red, green, blue, and I lift the green, I'll see the green. If I lift the two red, the red and the blue, I'll see the red and the blue. So that pattern depends on the position of the string. Now, a weaver will use that by pressing foot pedals to raise some strings up, then put the other string through in that direction, and you are weaving. It's a tremendously tedious job, it's a great skill, it takes a lot of time to do all of that stuff. 
Then this French guy came around and said, OK, all we're doing is raising strings. Let's put a bar over with some holes, press the whole lot with my foot. Only where the holes are can the rods go up, and only where the holes are will those strings be lifted. Then if I change the bar, then I will change the pattern. And that's exactly what he did. And he made these bars out of card, actually. They were big card rolls. They would roll over the head of the loom. You just pressed your foot when a new card was in, and automatically you got the pattern. And that pattern was encoded on the cards. Now, obviously, there was no choice involved here. There was no sensing involved here. The thing did that because it was made that way. It, it, it could only do that. Even though we changed the card, we could change the pattern. So, in a sense, that was, in fact, the first program. But equally, in a sense, it was responding to the way it was made. All these things are. So when we get lots of things all put together and lots of switches, we start to talk about things like sensing and knowing. And that starts to introduce mystery and confusion, because how does something sense? How does something know? And that's the way it is with charge controllers. We're looking at charge controller and we're talking about it sensing the voltage and changing this and changing that. The issue isn't about how it physically does it. The issue is about understanding how it knows. But of course, knowing is one of those things that's actually a bit of an illusion. And that's what I was illustrating at the beginning there. The light doesn't know that I've turned the switch. But equally, in another way of looking at it, the light does know that I've turned the switch. And so this idea of knowing, actually, is intrinsic to the build that we've actually made, the stuff that we use to do these jobs. Of course, there are many, many ways of doing a particular job, as we know. Well, I say that, but some people think there's only one way of doing it. It's not right. There are just many ways of doing it. If you think there's only one way of doing it, the perfect way, I am so sorry to tell you, but you're wrong, and you really need to rethink your position. Or at least, that's what I believe. Now, this idea of many ways of doing things gets even more confusing when people are trying to work out what it is they need to do. So, you need to build a charge controller. Fantastic! And then there's many ways of doing it. Oh, crikey, which one do you choose? And of course, that pushes you into looking at those many ways, trying to build something from those many ways. And to me, that's upside down. To me, what you need to do is work out what job it is you need to do. Then you need to look at the ways that job can be done and then choose an appropriate option for you to perform that job. So we change now our focus from looking at the many ways, which is just infinite actually, there's tons of them, to looking at the idea of the job. And of course that's exactly what Jacquard did. He looked at the machine and what the machine could intrinsically do, and then he created all of these cards because there were many ways to weave a carpet or a piece of cloth. But there aren't many ways to actually put that information into the loom. The loom is much more restrictive. And of course we want something that's much more restrictive. We want something that is a charge controller. That charge controller is only going to do a certain number of jobs. The jobs we wanted to do are the logic of the charge controller. Now we began by looking at voltage control and we began looking at voltage regulation. That's what that mechanical thing was all about. It was starting to look at charge controllers by looking at one section of what the charge controller does. Because the charge controller obviously has a number of jobs and we'll cover those later. But we looked at one job and then the possible implementations of that job. Now of course we did a mechanical version, because that's what they used to do when this stuff first started, first started to become important, because mechanical versions help you to grasp what's going on, in the same way that when I turn a light switch and the light goes off, it's not a mystery to everybody, we all understand what's going on. If we can look at something we can look at, we get a good understanding. But the job doesn't change. We need to do the same job. That is, we need to control the voltage going into a battery. Then it's a question of how we actually do that. 
Now, how we actually do that, how we implement that logic, is actually independent of the logic itself. Just because we use a solid state, or we use a mechanical relay, or we just use our eyes and a switch, it really doesn't matter. The job is being done by somebody or something. The job itself remains the same. So if I want to understand what it is that I need to do in order to build a charge controller, probably, or at least in my view, the worst approach is to go looking at things of trying to find the perfect answer. To my mind, the best approach is to look at what jobs that actual charge controller needs to do. Once you've sorted that out in your head, you can then look at how to implement those jobs. What you find people doing very often is telling you about the best implementation what they think is going to work really, really well. And of course, that so quickly becomes confusing because they lose sight of the job itself. And then people who are first coming to something and have um, a mystery surrounding that something and don't really understand what the logic of the job is and they focus on what other people are telling them, of course, it's confusing. What we need to do, according to me, and what I, the way I see it, is to work out what jobs the charge controller needs to do and then how we can actually implement those jobs. So essentially, as I say, what we're doing is we're breaking down the job into what a charge controller needs to do, and then how do we implement what it needs to do. And of course, that's an innocent statement, but hidden in there is in fact the bone of contention, and that is need. Now, different people have different ideas about what they need. And when they get an idea about what they need, of course they're going to argue for it because for some reason we make the assumption that what I need is what everybody needs. And of course that's just not true. People need different things. And when you break down into logical bits, you have the option of asking yourself, do I need to do that? And the answer may be no. Now, M I think it's MPPT is the current all-star of solar charge controllers and everybody tells you you need it. Now, I'm not saying that you do or don't need it. I'm saying ask yourself the question, do you need it? If the answer is no, because your needs aren't being met by that, don't use it. But of course some people say to themselves, I need it, you must need it, therefore do this. And that to me is the wrong approach. So this breaking it down into blocks gives you lots of opportunities, but it will also create quite a bit of argument. There's not a lot you can do about that. Have a bit more faith in your own needs. If you understand the blocks and your needs, you're going to find solutions. Anyway, I hope the video helped and thank you very much for watching.